Welcome to our research seminar today. Uh, so today the presentation will be given by uh, Leonid Lishuk, professor at the Department of Institutional Economics, Faculty of Economics, and also the head of the laboratory for applied, applied analysis of institutions and social capital. And today the topic will be about Russian regional institutions. So, Professor Lato. Thanks so much. <laughs> I think it's the first time I make a presentation here in English, which is a little bit odd, but I'll do my best. Uh, a brief history of this exercise. Uh, over several years, my colleagues and I uh, dealt with Russian regions as samples of institutional regimes. Uh, one such project was with Timur Nathov, we were trying to understand how institutional quality in Russian regions affects uh, choices of young people when they select their fields of studies. Another project was with Goshi Sunyaev, where we were trying to understand how the quality of Russian regional institutions is affected by some political factors, <coughs> such as, for example, uh, the rotation rate of Russian governors. Another project with Igor Malkov and some other co-authors, we were trying to understand how the quality of institutions in Russian, in Russian regions affects the payoffs to land ownership by Russian firms. So all of the above gave us enough reasons to try to summarize what do we know about uh, measuring Russian institutions. We use some haphazard measures available from different sources, but because it was something that became consistent and persistent, we got curious, can we take stock of uh, measures of Russian regional institutional quality. Can we draw some useful lessons from these measures? Can we perhaps propose some new measures that were not used before? Last but not least, are there some interesting stories that can be discovered when we look into our measures of the Russian institutional quality? And at that time, uh, uh, we were joined by some other colleagues, and I'm very glad to greet here Mikhail Roshlitz. From, uh, uh, from another unit of the Harris School of Economics and his colleague, he's not here today, it's Alexei Buranov, uh, 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 Gosha Sunyaev, uh, last but not least, Igor Malkov, and he might be able to make it here still. So this is the Magnificent Five, or the Gang of Five, if you like, that decided to undertake this exercise, and this is what we got. Uh, okay, that doesn't sound very good. Is it sabotage or, you know? I, let me try to do it again, sorry about this. Oh, good. <coughs> so one thing that, uh, mm -hmm. that's, that is really striking when you look at Russia, Russia is a single country, admittedly it's a very big country of course, a country with a huge variety of natural conditions, economic conditions, social conditions, history, so on and so forth. But nonetheless, uh, it's still surprising how deep is the interregional variation of uh, institutional quality across Russian regions. How deep are the variations of the quality of governance? How big, how huge is the discrepancy of the availability of different public goods, of the quality of regulations, of the rule of law, so on and so forth. This is a variety that can rarely be observed in a single country. And uh, on the one thing, it's probably something which is not really very good. But on the other, on the other hand, it gives uh, analysts, researchers, scholars an excellent opportunity to study uh, the causes and consequences of institutional variations. And we, you know, we cannot uh, pass up this excellent opportunity. If you want to study the institutional variety in Russia, of course, uh, it is very important to be able to use uh, good measures of the institutional quality and institutional performance because we want to be quantitative and uh, to be quantitative we need measures, we need indices. <coughs> uh, most of comparative analysis of institutions are conducted at the cross-country level. However, there is an increasing strand of comparative institutional analysis, which is subnational, and uh, some authors, Snyder, political scientist, recently drew attention to the fact that if you do comparative uh, institutional analysis or comparative policy analysis at the subnational level, there is a large number of important advantages, which are not available at the cross-country level. 
And the main advantage, as far as I'm concerned, is that when you deal with uh, uh, subnational jurisdictions, units of a single nation, uh, there is much lower risk of having an omitted variable bias. It's very well known that when you do regressions at the cross-country level, uh, these regressions are quite often viewed suspiciously, simply because countries are so different from each other. And even if you do your best to control for conceivable variables that affect the factors that you want to study, still there is this nagging question, have you taken into account everything which might be important and relevant? And of course, such questions can still be asked when you do uh, cross-regional analysis, but because this is a single country, because uh, these subnational units are parts of the single market, because they're subject to the same national legislation, because they share so much in common in their history, because uh, very likely there are strong similarities uh, in the composition of population, so on and so forth, but dependencies are <coughs> often the same for all of these units. <coughs> then uh, the, the risks that there are some variables uh, that are important for analysis and which have been omitted, these risks are much lower. And as a result, all else being equal, uh, it, has, it makes a whole lot of sense to do comparative institutional analysis at the, national, at the, at the, at the, at the level of uh, regions of a single country. Now, of course, uh, for such analysis to be relevant, uh, you should have enough of variations in the institutional quality, you should have enough of variations of possible causes and effects uh, of institutional diversity. And again, Russia is uniquely suitable for these purposes because you have uh, 80 plus subnational units on the one hand. On the other hand, as I said, Russia exhibits uh, fantastic institutional variety uh, and as a result, uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity that we decided to explore. So what, we, what did we want to do in this study? There are several things, and some of these objectives were ahead of us from the very beginning, from get-go, and some others emerged in the course of this work. Our first order of business was to take stock of the available regional institutional indices. Measuring national institutions has become a cottage industry, <coughs> and there are probably hundreds of institutional measures at the national level available from different sources. And it's a very big and important task to analyze those. However, as far as Russia is concerned, the number of the available institutional measures might be not that great, but it's still quite impressive. There are several dozen altogether of measures of institutional quality, so proxies of institutional quality available from different sources that we know about. And chances are some of those are not known to us. So there is a set of data that uh, deserves to be investigated, explored, analyzed. And this is something that we wanted to do first. Second, what we wanted to do is to see to what extent different measures of institutional quality in Russia agree with each other. In other words, um, can we talk about good institutions or bad institutions? Can we, good, can we talk about regions with strong or weak institutional environment? And of course, there might be variations and nuances in answering these questions, but if there is a high degree of agreement of conformity, speaking quantitatively, if there is a high degree of correlation, between different institutional measures, then I think we could say that, for example, region X is a region with strong institutions, and region Y is a region with weak institutions, and region Z is somewhere in the middle. However, if different measures of institutional quality do not exhibit such agreement with each other, if sometimes they're orthogonal, if sometimes their correlation is of an, uh, of an unnatural sign, <coughs> then uh, we can probably conclude that uh, uh, regional institutional regimes are inherently multidimensional. And it makes little sense to rank them in the term of the overall institutional quality. You have to look into different institutions, into different aspects, angles, so on and so forth. Then third, in the course of working on this project, we got hold of some new promising sources of data. And Michael and Alexei supplied uh, extremely useful, interesting sources of data that they knew about. Uh, Yegor Malkov and myself, uh, we used uh, data that were made available rather recently by, from a project which is known as BIPS. Uh, BIPS is a European Bank of Reconstruction and Development's uh, empirical project which has been underway for a number of years. And <coughs> under this project there were several waves of enterprise surveys in countries covered by uh, this project. And Russia was covered by this project, and uh, it's too bad Igor is not here. He's the main expert on BIP. Is he? Oh my, 
Jesus, Igor. All right, so Igor is here, so he will, I, I feel much relieved. Uh, 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 there are three waves, right, in Russia? Five waves in Russia. All five in Russia. Okay, all right, so all five waves were in Russia. Uh, the latest one was the 2012 wave, which covered thousands and thousands of Russian firms, randomly selected from 37 regions, and uh, samples were representative in every region. So that was a fantastic source of data. And in this survey, as you will see, <coughs> there are a large number of questions that uh, firm managers were answering, which were immediate relevance on the institutional quality. And uh, we wanted to see if we can come up with some new measures of ins regional institutional quality that would be drawn from the BIPs project. And uh, we would like to see how these measures agree with those that existed before. That was now our objective number three. Objective number four, <clears throat> is it possible to develop a typology of uh, Russian institutional regimes? Of course, there were quite a number of attempts of that kind, especially in the early and mid-1990s, where Russian regions followed very different paths of uh, institutional reform. But at that time, the axis <coughs> along which the regimes were ranked or typologies were developed were primarily liberal versus conservative. And uh, is there anything of that kind which can be used now? Can we develop some ideas about clusters, types? of regional institutional regimes, and if so, would it be along the same old axis, liberal, conservative, or maybe something else? So that was now, a, well, that was our fourth question. And uh, our research question number five <coughs> was dynamics. Some measures of institutional quality are available for different periods of time. And that, I'm talking about regions, of course. And that gives us a very interesting opportunity to see uh, in which directions uh, Russian regional institutions evolved over time. Uh, the Russia-wide average, national average institutional trends over the last decade were not quite, quite, qu quite positive. Uh, uh, in international rankings reflected, at least according to these data, a fairly steady deterioration of institutional quality in Russia along uh, the main indices, sometimes more dramatic, sometimes less so. <coughs> quite obviously, the corruption has become much worse. Uh, there was some improvement in terms of regulatory quality, but these are national trends, and of course, these national trends hide uh, this uh, fantastic, exciting interregional variations. And the question is, uh, what happened in particular regions alongside these national trends? Uh, did regions follow the national trends? For example, if the quality of institutions declined on the average nationwide, can we observe something similar at the regional level? Well, probably yes, because the national uh, 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 indices are somewhat averages of the regional ones, but to what extent this trend was uniform. And then another interesting question that we want to answer was to what extent uh, leaders and laggards in terms of institutional quality remain the same. If regions X, Y, and Z uh, were regions leading in terms of institutional quality 10 years ago, are they still leaders? Or vice versa, if regions uh, X, Y, and Z were at the bottom of the rankings, are they still there? And finally, last but not least, a question which I think is really very interesting and deserves to be explored at much greater depth, and this is something that I hope we will do. And I should caution that what we present in the report here <coughs> is still very much work in progress. We've observed some interesting facts and we decided it might be a good idea to share those at this point of time, but uh, there are a a large number of, there is a large number of questions that still need to be properly explored, and I hope that this team will uh, continue doing this uh, for at least a couple of years to come. But one of these questions is <coughs> as follows. Uh, do we observe divergence or convergence of regional institutions, regimes in Russia? Do Russian regions, uh, admittedly, there are big variations, but are these variations go getting smaller, narrower, or are they getting wider? Uh, a convergence or divergence, and especially do we have this convergence or divergence against the backdrop of the decline of the institutional quality nationwide? That's not an obvious question to answer, and we do have some answer to this question, which I will show you uh, a little bit down the road. What we did first was to uh, review the vast literature about measuring institution spirit. And of course, most of this literature is about measuring national institutions. Uh, and in this literature, uh, there are several approaches that people use to measure institutions. 
And as I said, there is a cottage industry in applied economics uh, which deals with institutional measurement. Uh, so what are the approaches that people use? The first one is uh, the so-called formal approach. Uh, and uh, when we talk about formal approach, uh, people usually use literally the definition of institutions which were given by you know, some founding fathers such as North. Institutions are long-term rules of the game that shape expectations, so on and so forth. And if so, if you want to measure institutions, see if there are long-term rules in place. And these long-term rules should be rooted in law, in constitution, other formal checks and balances, other constitutional requirements, other agency that uh, support uh, competition, so on and so forth. So you simply review the formal parts of institutional environments of different units of your sample, being that countries or regions, and uh, you draw your institutional measures accordingly. Now, formal approach has a number of downsides, and I'm going to talk about that shortly. An alternative is to use expert judgments. Uh, but in that case, experts are outsiders. Uh, and this is what usually happens with institutional ins measurement nationwide. There is a well-known governance matters project. And roots of that project are in the work of international ranking agencies. In fact, uh, the very first measures of institutional quality that economists used uh, over 20 years ago were uh, rankings of investment climate. And these rankings were uh, supplied by uh, uh, a number of consulting firms, ranking agencies, that were selling their data to international investors. And such rankings usually uh, are based on expert judgments. You bring a group of people in the know and you ask them to compare relative merits and demerits of institutions in different countries. So this is the second option. This is experts' opinions. An alternative, and I think it's a much more reliable alternative, is to use <coughs> assessments of users is to use the opinions of people with immediate first-hand knowledge of institutions, people who deal with institutions in their everyday life, people who are beneficiaries of good institutions and people who are victims of bad institutions. And such users' assessments are usually based on different types of business environment surveys. BIPs is a good example of this. But as far as national institutions are concerned, uh, there is a project which is known as the economic freedom of the world. And this project is based on institutional assessments uh, produced by Fraser Institute in Vancouver, British Columbia. And uh, these assessments are based solely on surveys of those who feel these institutions on their backbones firsthand. Uh, yet another option is to use direct measurement. You want to make your cross-country comparisons uh, reliable and meaningful, so you want to make sure you compare apples to apples, not apples to oranges. And in that case, what you do is to ask people what happens in standard situations, such as applying for a license, such as settling a dispute of a certain size in monetary terms, so on and so forth, uh, such as clearing regulatory barriers. So you collect measures of, uh, of what happens uh, when people deal with these standard situations, you aggregate such measures accordingly, and you come up with direct measures of institutional quality. Last but not least, and um, uh, sometimes you cannot observe institutions directly. Sometimes you, can me you cannot measure institutions directly. Institutions are something which is not tangible. Institutions are something which often is imaginary, but something which is relevant for economic outcomes. So what you can do, though, is to observe economic outcomes and to deduce institutional quality measures from such outcomes. Uh, let me give you just one example. Mansour Olson argued for a long time that informal economy, shadow economy, is a refuge from bad institutions. And therefore, if you have strong institution, then you, you should have small uh, informal economy, which is usually a, 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 you know, a sanctuary for quasi-legal or illegal activities, which happen in every country. But if institutions are bad, then the informal economy swells. And as a result, what you see in the informal economy is a good number of transactions that would ordinarily and normally be conducted in the formal sector. And people do it informally simply because they don't trust good institution, uh, formal institutions. And therefore, the size of the formal economy uh, is a measure of the institutional quality. And you can think of some other measures of this kind, investments, especially foreign investments, so on and so forth. But there is a big question about uh, this uh, option, observable institutional outcomes. If you use this option, 
uh, why do you need measures of institutional quality? You ideally want to have these measures to predict economic outcomes. But if you deduce these measures from economic outcomes, then the, uh, and if you want still to use the very same measures to explain economic outcome, then surely we'll have a strong correlation. But causality will be, of course, and they're a very big question mark. So there, are, there is a good number of uh, ways to measure institutions, but none of those is perfect. What you can do in this case is to draw measures from variable sources is to employ different measures of institutional quality. And of course, every single measure is likely to be biased, is likely to be subject to different noises. <clears throat> so a natural way to go is to aggregate these measures. And hopefully, uh, in the process of this aggregation, noises will be canceling each other off. And as a result, you know, by, by the sheer law of big numbers, <coughs> the noise of this aggregate is going to be much less than for every single measure. And this is, of course, the main idea uh, behind this very well-known governance methods project, which was launched by the World Bank, I think it was about 20 years ago. And they reproduced this measure. Was it Timur or what? Uh, give or take. And, uh, and they reproduce these measures every single year. What they do, they aggregate uh, uh, different measures of institutional quality in clusters, and for every cluster, they, uh, they average these measures using some sophisticated technique that I was never able to quite understand. And as a result, uh, they come up with uh, six measures, very well known, voice and accountability, political stability and nonviolence, regulatory quality, governance of effectiveness, rule of law, and corruption prevention. And among others, we use these measures as well. They are very popular in the literature. But uh, <coughs> nonetheless, these measures are subject to considerable criticism. And some people are very skeptical uh, about uh, these measures, or for that matter, of measures of institutional quality, period, to begin with. And uh, on this slide, you see some of the reasons to be cautious, to be skeptical, to be doubtful. Uh, one, first, one, one such reason is, remember I said that uh, you can measure, you can use formal approach to measure institutions. In that case, you take into account institutions de jure. Uh, so, uh, well, sad news is that formal institutions are by and large uncorrelated with economic outcomes. Uh, whether you have some formal institutions in place or not, uh, the relevance of this presence of institutions de jure for something that happens on the ground is very limited, if at all. And there is a, there is a good number of stories confirming this fact. <coughs> Melissa Thomas, I happen to know that uh, lady, she is quite skeptical, by the way, but uh, I think uh, she, uh, she was particularly skeptical in this particular uh, paper that I'm referring to, uh, she reviewed critically the available approaches to the measures of institutional quality. And she said, you know what, uh, your main problems are not that your measures are noisy. That's of secondary importance. They might be. The main problem is you don't know what you measure. Uh, because uh, uh, when you, for example, when you try to measure government effectiveness, what is government effectiveness? It's some imaginary construct. It's not a real thing. And you might have some very vague ideas about what this imaginary construct is, but you haven't really answered the question if there is something in the real world behind the measures and the ideas that you have. So that was the main uh, direction of Melissa Thomas' criticism. Uh, Dan Friesman, <coughs> in his 2007 paper, summarized a large, mem a large number of measures of corruption nationwide. Uh, across uh, around the world at the national level. So there was, okay, this is Alexei Buran of another co author, and uh, uh, so I'm glad Alexei is here. Uh, and, and, and again, Triesman uh, arrived to some very uncomfortable conclusions. Uh, uh, you're talking about a particular institution, about a particular inst institutional pathology, corruption. So if you measure corruption uh, from different sources, from different angles, from different perspectives, you hope that these measures will be in agreement with each other. Because, well, corruption is corruption, right? So what Trisman concluded was that that's not the case. And for example, if you take corruption measures from uh, two different sources, one is, uh, I, I cannot spend too much time talking about how to measure corruption. But basically, there are two main ways to assess corruption. The first one is corruption perception. And the second one is corruption experience. You asked, uh, how corrupt is the environment about, around you? That's corruption perception. And then you asked, uh, have you been 
faced with some situation where corruption occurred. That's corruption experience. And first of all, the correlation between corruption perception and corruption experience is not very high to begin with. And secondly, and more importantly, different factors that can be observed are relevant for corruption perception, for corruption experience. And therefore, it appears that corruption perception and corruption experience are by and large disjoint measures of institutional pathologies and therefore it would be inappropriate to talk about countries more corrupt or less corrupt. You have to be clear as to what kind of corruption you're talking about and how you measure corruption. Now, uh, a big reason to be skeptical about uh, national institutional measures is that sometimes they exhibit fantastically high agreement with each other. If you take correlation of these indices, voice and accountability, political stability, then cross correlations of these measures across countries of the world are in the range of 0 0.7, 0 0.8. They're almost never less than 0 0.5, 0 0.6. All of them are extremely highly statistically significant. And what does it mean? Guido Tabellini, in his famous 2008 paper, said that that means that some countries have good institutions, some countries uh, have bad institutions, period, nothing else, you know. Uh, uh, all happy families are happy, and, you know, and something of that kind. Uh, but uh, uh, Steve Nack, and I don't remember the name of his co-author, uh, Langbane, they disagreed and they said, uh, they did some factor analysis, they did some statistical analysis, and they said that uh, chances are that these uh, correlations are kind of spurious and they reflect uh, common approaches to measurement and common biases that take place in measurement rather than the real correlation between different parts of the institutional environment. And therefore, you have to be very skeptical and careful about using such measures. What might be uh, a reason for such uh, uh, correlation? Uh, Prana Barthan, uh, quite a while ago, he pointed out to the so-called halo effect. Halo effect, you know what is halo, right? It's, it's a, a circle around something that shines. And halo effect uh, means that if you try to assess the quality of institutions, Say in Sweden, you see a prosperous, stable, uh, rich country, and you say, of course, you know, what else? They have great institutions. And when you uh, try to assess the quality of institutions in Sudan, you see a country which is uh, torn by wars, which is a basket case, and you say, of course, bad institutions. But again, you deduce institutions from outcomes, and therefore you have the circularity that cannot be trusted. Very quickly, uh, it might not be even appropriate to try to measure separate institutions in terms, because if you want to measure economic payoff to separate institutions, it depends not on these institutions alone, but on how they combine with each other. Institutions complement each other. And this is another reason to be careful with institutional measurement. And last but not least, some countries which have low scores in terms of institutional ranking, they do quite well. And China is just one example. So sometimes institutions which are non-conventional, which uh, get lower scores, you know, they, they, they do the job and therefore maybe your measures are not that good. So what are the lessons that can be learned from, uh, from the 20 year plus years experience of measuring national institutions? Uh, w the first lesson is that institutions most likely are multidimensional. So don't try to say that this is a good institutional environment, this is a bad institutional environment. Be specific. Uh, the second is that institutions affect economic outcomes through various channels and mechanisms. Daron Asimoglu uh, produced a paper, when was that paper? Never mind, I think it was a few years ago. It's so, so easy to get lost in Asimoglu's papers. <laughs> but uh, I I in that paper, they basically pointed out that uh, uh, property institutions and contract institutions, uh, protection of property rights and protection of contract rights, are quite different institutions and they have very different economic outcomes and they have very different significance. So be cognizant of the multiplicity of channels uh, connecting institutions with outcomes. Uh, one should try to avoid measurement biases and therefore the best way to do that is to use uh, institutional measures from various sources and also to use measures which are ideally transparent, that you know how these measures are derived, you know how these measures, uh, what data are, have been used to uh, produce these measures and ideally you should be able to replicate this measures derivation. And <coughs> Last but not least, to address the concerns of Melissa Thomas, are these real things or imaginary constructs, it would be best not to try to impose a structure 
on, uh, on, the, on the manifolds of institutions, it would be best to have the structure endogenous, reflecting uh, links between different aspects and dimensions of institutional measurement. It should be deduced from data, not to impose on your data beforehand. Now, let's, uh, with these lessons learned, let's uh, have a look at Russian regional institutions. And first of all, <coughs> uh, and first of all, why Russian regional uh, institutions are so diverse? Well, of course, a very big country, a country with complex history, a country which has been through thick and thin, uh, and history does matter for the variety of institutions in Russia. Sometimes, surprisingly, remote history is still relevant for present day's institutions. Uh, Paul Dower and Andrei Markevich have just published a paper, and in this paper they argue that privatization in Russia uh, 10, 15 years ago uh, was strongly correlated uh, with the intensity of riots uh, against landlords that occurred in Russia at the time of the First Revolution, 100 years earlier. So there are some historical roots, there are some persistency that affects today's institutional outcomes. It is very well known that geography, <coughs> Timur can tell tons of stories, he, he, he knows that literature very well, <laughs> how geography uh, and natural resources affect institutional quality. So we have every reason to expect the same in Russia. Economy and access to global markets. Uh, the, 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 the economic legacy of the central planning was highly uneven. And of course, when uh, Russian regions uh, entered the, area, the period of market economy, uh, uh, they had very different assets, very different legacy. And that couldn't but affect the institution that we observe in these regions. The 1990s, uh, they were extremely important uh, for today's uh, situation, the Russian economy, society, politics, so on and so forth. Among other things, they were extremely important for the variety of uh, Russian regional institutions. In part because in the 1990s, it was a deliberate choice of the central government to outsource institutional reform to the regions. Uh, it was a political compromise. Some reforms were too politically complicated to take place at the national level. So Yeltsin uh, made that famous offer to the regions, take as much power as you can digest, do whatever you like. And then your people will judge you and the economy will judge you. So you'll be responsible for institutional choices. And uh, the, the Russian economy, uh, the Russian regions responded to this very generous offer in a variety of ways. And at that time, there was, you know, these stereotypes that uh, Nizhny Novgorod was an extremely liberal region and Ulyanovsk was an extremely conservative region. So there was a huge variety of institutional regimes. Quite obviously, at that time, people hoped that uh, there will be some market adjustments, that if some regions made wrong institutional choices, then market pressure will force them to fix their mistakes simply because they will be penalized by a lack of investments, by brain drain, by some other things. So they will be under strong market pressure to, uh, to improve their institution. That was the idea of the so-called market-preserving federalism. According to this idea, regions, subnational units, subjects of federation, <coughs> can uh, have a broad discretion in setting their institutions and policies. But if there is a free market, uh, then uh, you should observe some convergence of these institutions to strong, effective, enabling institutions, simply because regions compete with each other for uh, mobile resources. And such convergence did not take place in Russia. And uh, there are several papers that explain why it didn't take place. In fact, it contributed to an increased divergence of Russian institutional environment, and we still see some, some traces of this divergence. <coughs> now, uh, uh, came 1999-2000, and it was a complete game changer, of course, instead of this freewheeling economy and take as much power as you like, we, uh, we have, we've been having what is known as vertical power. And vertical power was about, all about preserving the unity, suppressing diversity, uh, uh, ensuring uniformity of national regis legislation, reducing discretion of regions, so on and so forth. Uh, so now, 15 years uh, after living under the vertical power, we should expect a whole lot of institutional homogeneity, which we do not see. And therefore, uh, it's important to, uh, to understand why, despite of these efforts and official policies, to uh, make the country more unified, more uniform, and so on, it still exhibits huge variety 
of institutional regime. And there are several explanations. One is Yakovlev and Juravskaya, not Andrei Yakovlev, another Yakovlev, uh, have recently uh, produced a paper when they argue that the enforcement of national laws, for example, the laws that were enacted to liberalize the Russian economy uh, 10 plus <coughs> years ago, that enforcement was very uneven and was strongly affected by some features that were specific to individual regions. Quite obviously, despite of this unifor, un, unifying vertical hierarchical bureaucratic structure, the de facto capacity of the central government to control what is going on in the regions is still very limited. And as a result, uh, there is a high degree of tolerance uh, at the federal center as to what is happening uh, at the, uh, in the regions. There are some, some flags that the central government observes. There are some things that have to be delivered. And as long as those are delivered and you know what the things are, uh, you are pretty much in control of uh, what is happening in your regions and also because uh, direct democratic accountability of regional administrations to to the regional population was significantly reduced over the last 10 years so we, we have every reason to consider regional institutions as endogenous in other words institutions are shaped by regional administrations and reflect uh, very diverse preferences very diverse opportunities uh, very diverse uh, uh, exogenous factors so institutions are endogenous uh, to, 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 to the preferences of regional policy makers. And I should also mention here, before we go further, that at the very same time, the, uh, the uh, measuring regional institutions has all of a sudden become an important uh, priority for the government, for the central government. No one cared about, except for some scholars and analysts, about measuring institutional quality in the 1990s. But from mid-2000s onwards, measuring institutional quality in regions has become a very important political thing because uh, if you remember, governors were not electable for some period of time, and uh, now they're kind of electable. But uh, if they're not electable, then uh, you have to be able to measure their performance because it's up to the president, up, it's up to the central government to hire and fire governors. So how can you measure the performance of governors? Well, uh, use institutional indices, and there was an explosion of uh, institutional indices. Uh, in fact, such measurement was mandated by a degree, uh, a decree by, uh, by the Russian president passed in 2007. And a special uh, agency, uh, Alexei will correct me if I'm wrong, called YEMIS. What does YEMIS stand for? That's the government database. OK, right. But the database was set to be used to draw official assessments of the performance of regional administrations, right? Yemis, anyway. And I think it was somehow affiliated officially with FSB or, you know, no? No, okay, never mind. But uh, there, was a, there was a very funny trend because initially when uh, it was realized that we need measures, indices to assess the performance of regional governors, uh, uh, there was a couple of dozen of indices that were to be used. And then the number of, his ind of these indices was mushrooming. And at the peak, at the, uh, uh, at the culmination climax of this activity, there were several hundred. And some of these measures were quite exotic and bizarre. Birth rate in regions was something that governor's performance was rated by. Uh, uh, one, uh, among the latest innovation, there is one that uh, measures the innovation activity in the region. So that was something that. Uh, you have to take into account when you decide if a governor deserves to be reinstated in his office. And uh, intercultural, interethnic, and uh, interreligious harmony was another measure. And I was curious, for example, you have a region uh, where the number of pogroms has declined by two, and uh, the number of patents has also declined by five. So is it, uh, is it an improvement overall on that? How do you measure uh, interethnic harmony and innovation and so on and so forth? So uh, it, clearly it was an attempt to measure the unmeasurable. OK, now let's talk about our empirical part. What sources of data we have? We try to, as I said, to take stock of institutional measures from different sources. And what these sources are? First, it's rating agencies of different kinds. Really? Well, I, I guess, uh, give me 15 minutes, okay? And then I'll, I'll I, I, I didn't watch the time. I'll, I'll try to wrap it up. I thought I had another half an hour, but. 
I should have thought better. Okay, it's a big topic, okay, it's a big country, it's 80 regions. If you give me half a minute per region, I guess we'll be okay. Uh, have some respect of, the, of Russia, if not myself. Mm -hmm. right? uh, sources of data, uh, 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 seriously, I'll, I'll, I'll try to wrap it up. Uh, expert, RA, rating agency expert, this is the best known uh, source of uh, institutional measures in Russia. Business associations, Apora Rasi, uh, produce uh, uh, assessments of institutional climate. Different government agencies, Alexei explained what is YEMIS, uh, Min Region, uh, it's an abolished ministry, but uh, it existed for quite some time, and Ministerstvo Regionalnevo Razvita, Min Region, was also responsible for producing institutional measures. <coughs> Different think tanks, Carnegie, Indem, NISIP, and international organizations. Now, I'm not sure how much you see here. Do you see anything? Not really. Well, uh, this is a more, uh, by the way, I should mention that uh, uh, essentially this study has been published in, uh, in the second issue of Vaprosa Economica for this year in Russian, and we are preparing an English version, and it's just uh, uh, out of print, so uh, you could have a look if you need any details. But uh, basically, uh, we list here different sources of data, uh, and I'll read quickly what we have here. Uh, Investment rating by RA expert, and this rating has been produced uh, regularly from the year 2000 onwards, every year. Apora uh, measure different aspects of institutional climate, uh, of institutional environment, entrepreneurial climate, corruption, red tape, crime prevention, so on and so forth. Uh, YEMIS basically measures public opinions about regional administrations and they've been doing it over several years, since the year 2007. Min Region uh, uh, does, by and large, the same. We, we, we made use of Rostat data uh, that uh, uh, measures the size of uh, the employment in the informal sector. And our colleagues, uh, uh, Vladimir Gimpelson and uh, his uh, co-workers, they're involved in those. Apparently, it's a good source of data. Uh, we use different, uh, we use corruption rankings produced by uh, uh, Carnegie Moscow Center, and I think they did so in conjunction with Transparency International and INDEM. Uh, NISA, which is a think tank that monitors the environment for small and medium enterprises, uh, monitors the presence of anti-corruption legislation. And uh, uh, Mikhail and uh, Alexei have supplied a large source of data on crime, especially on economic crime such as raidership, such as violence against entrepreneurs, such as court cases, so on and so forth. Last but not least, thanks to Igor, uh, and uh, thanks to also Eric Bergloff, who gave us access to, full access to BIPS data. We have some measures uh, of institutional quality from that source. And just to tell you what these measures are, you can assess rule of law, uh, red tape, business security, access to infrastructure, corruption, so on and so forth. It's a very extensive source of data, and I'm sure it's going to be used very, very actively. Now, uh, the first thing we did was to see how these measures agree with each other. So what we did, we calculated very simply correlations between these indices. And if these are uh, quantitative indices, it's conventional correlations. If at least one of these indices is a ranking, then it's a uh, rank correlation. Uh, it's uh, Spearman's uh, rank correlation. Uh, and you certainly won't be able to see much from this table. So take, take, take my word that of, of conceivable uh, pairwise correlations, uh, uh, only 40% are stat statistically significantly different from zero. So most of the time they're not correlated with each other, which means that they do not quite agree with each other. And of those 40%, only two thirds have the expected sign. Uh, so uh, they are either uncorrelated with each other, or if they are, then they do not have the expected sign. And if I had a better opportunity, if I had a better screen, you would have seen it yourself. Take it as my word for the time being. And some of these uh, correlations are uh, somewhat surprising, mind-boggling. Luckily, unfortunately, uh, rankings that are produced by government, by the central government, they by and large agree with each other. So at least there is some consistency within the federal bureaucracy as to what are good and what are bad institutions. Uh, what, I, what, what is really surprising, I'm not sure you see it, oh, you do, excellent. Uh, corruption, for example, is negatively correlated to the size of informal sector. 
And you usually expect that informal sector is an outcome of bad institutions, corruption, so on and so forth. And you would expect positive correlation between corruption and size. Now it's negative, and I think Michael, uh, Mikhail wants to look deeper into that. One possible explanation is that people hide in the informal sector from corruption. And as a result, if you have a big informal sector, there is not enough room for corruption because corruption is something that takes place in the formal sector. But there are these kind of surprises in these correlations. And, uh, and uh, so that's the first thing that we wanted to do. And then the question is, so what? What conclusions do we draw from uh, these uh, findings? Uh, uh, clearly, r Russian uh, regional institutional indices uh, exhibit much less unanimity than national institutional indices. But does it mean that uh, regional institutions are really multidimensional. Unfortunately, there is not enough of clarity as to how these indices are drawn. And even the expert array ranking, ranking agency, you know, they are quite tight-lipped as to how precisely these measures are derived. They give some very general explanations, but then they say, well, that's just about it that we want to divulge. And as a result, we cannot really fully trust these measures and cannot make any defin definitive conclusions on these measures alone. So then we decided to try to come up with our own measures, and that was BIPs. And uh, here is a, bif a brief description of the data which are available from BIPs. We take fifth wave of BIPs, over 4,000 firms, 37 regions, and here you see a list of dimensions, or for that matter institutions, that uh, BIPs data shed light on. The approach to measurement is quite straightforward. You take responses of firms on questions which pertain to different types of institutions, and you average these responses for a given region. Lo and behold, you have an institutional index. And this approach is very similar to the Fraser Institute's uh, Economic Freedom of the World institutional measures, because we do not use expert judgments at all. We base our institutional measures on direct responses of people who operate in the, in the private sector. Uh, what we did next was, of course, we wanted to try to aggregate this measure somewhat. And we used different aggregation techniques. One was to simply conduct factor analysis on different institutional measures and see what factors emerge as a result. Another one was to do something similar, and that was to use, uh, to, to, to assign institutions to <coughs> different clusters and to do factor analysis and aggregation uh, in these clusters. We combined both approaches and they, uh, they led to similar results. Parametric methods with some initial pre-clusterization and factor analysis of the whole array of data. But basically what we have at the end are different types of institutions. And uh, please be careful here. This is one of the findings that worth to be you know, paid pay some attention at. And there is another one, and I'm nearly done, so I guess I'll wrap up almost in time. Uh, our definition of institution is something that also needs to be uh, made explicit. There is a large debate as to what is institution, what is not institution. And I think these debates are largely counterproductive. It's important to agree what we understand by institutions, and this is very simply a part of environment where firms operate. Uh, uh, institutions shape operational environment for private sector firms. So everything that affects this environment is an institution. And uh, if we agree and accept this definition, then we can distinguish between two types of institutions. One we call institutions rules. And, and, and these are the rules that you have to observe if you want to run a business. Another one is institution services. It's uh, access to something that you need to operate a business, access to markets, access to infrastructure, access to finance, and also security of uh, running business. So institutions rules and uh, institutions uh, services. As far as institutions rules are concerned, we're interested in different patterns of corruption in Russian regions, and also in red tape, and also in the rule of law. And remember, I mentioned, I, I, I started from saying that uh, in the, in the 1990s, people were uh, trying to develop patterns of institutions in terms of less liberal, uh, less conservative, liberal versus conservative. Uh, it probably won't be a good idea to do the same uh, 20 years later, but how about corruption? Less corrupt, more corrupt, or maybe corrupt in a different way? And this is precisely what we managed to do. Uh, we were able to, uh, to discern uh, different 
institutional patterns among institutions' rules. Uh, institutional pattern number one is what we tentatively dubbed administrative chaos. What are characteristics of administrative chaos is rampant bribery. Uh, bribery by uh, multiple agencies, uh, the necessity to pay bribes frequently and uh, in an unpredictable way. Another dimension of this uh, administrative chaos is a very burdensome tax administration, red tape, a whole lot of, uh, of obstacles to doing business and unnecessary. Uh, so. The second pattern is what we call administrative order. Uh, corruption is still there. Corruption is a fact of life, but it's a different type of corruption. It's a corruption which is centralized. Uh, you pay big bribes, you pay uh, big kickbacks, but you do it not very often. You do it once, you do it twice, and you have a license to operate uh, trouble-free afterwards. It's uh, corruption still, but it's a corruption of one-stop shop kind. It's uh, princip adnavo akna. Uh, it's very convenient. It simply it saves a great deal on your transaction costs. And the third uh, institutional rule is the rule of law. Uh, this index is uh, derived by uh, aggregating answers to the questions as to how fair, timely, and efficient is the court system. And these are factor loadings. I hope you can see at least this one. Institutional type one. Uh, frequent bribes. Uh, pay to officials, frequent bribes pay to customs, frequent bribes pay to costs, frequent bribes pay to tax administer, to tax uh, officials. Taxation is a big barrier to doing business. Licensing is a big barrier to doing business. That's it. Uh, and these are factor loads, all of them are positive and big. Pattern number two, average size of uh, kickbacks uh, when you want to have a state contract. Uh, average size of bribes that you pay to government officials. So pattern number two, big bribes, big kickbacks, but not very often, just once. Rule of law, as I said, I explained what it is, and then we have institutional services. These are access to utilities, electricity, telecommunication. This is uh, security, uh, security costs, uh, losses from crime, and crimes and disorders a barrier to business. And then there is access to finance, but we had only one measure, so there is no aggregation. Okay, so we have three types of uh, institutions rules, administrative chaos, administrative order, rule of law, and we have a number of measures for institutional quality. Uh, a small piece of background uh, in, in the corruption literature, uh, there, is, there is an agreement in the literature and it goes back to the famous paper by Schleifer and Wischnick called Corruption, published in 1993, that uh, centralized corruption is better than decentralized corruption. And you might have heard about that, simply because in the case of decentralized corruption, on the top of the burden that corruption causes, you multiply this burden by a tragedy of the commons type. Every official bribes uh, the very same private sector agents, and that imposes externalities. And these externalities are not taken into account. As a result, the burden of corruption uh, in the case of decentralized corruption is much heavier than centralized. So all else equal, if you want to live, uh, in, if you are to live in a corrupt environment and you want to, uh, and you have some discretion as to whether corruption is going to be centralized or decentralized, choose the one which is centralized. Varugi uh, Kravapice, and this is precisely what I, uh, what I, ground theft is better than blood sucking. And we have some comparative evidence that this is precisely the case, but it's not about corruption only. It appears that the institutional pattern of centralized corruption is a pattern which gives better access to institution services. If you live in a region with administrative order, which is characterized by centralized corruption, big bribes, big kickbacks paid once or twice, uh, in that case your access to uh, business infrastructure, to production inputs is better than otherwise. And uh, it can be explained by sim very simple arguments made by Mansour Olson many years ago. If there are some people in control of the whole regional economy and they, they tax this economy effectively by means of centralized corruption, then of course they have the incentive for this economy to be big to develop, to flourish, and as a result you have this encompassing interest which explain. Now please have a look at this uh, table. This is the one that we like in particular. It shows that uh, institutional type two, uh, which is, uh, administrative, which is uh, administrative order, is very significantly positively correlated with access to infrastructure and access to security. 
and also with access to finance. In the case of institutional type one, which is administrative chaos, no correlation with access to infrastructure, access to security, some correlation with access to finance, but access to finance is more global. It's lesser a matter of regional discretion. In terms of production inputs for which regions are responsible, that is security and access to infrastructure, businesses are much, much better off than in the case of uh, administrative chaos. One startling observation is that the rule of law is not correlated with any of those. So the rule of law is orthogonal, uh, literally and metaphorically, to the institutional quality in the Russian regions. And there is a high correlation between institution services. Uh, and another interesting thing to observe uh, is that, well, this is a summary of what I said, but how about government rankings? It appears that government rankings favor much more regions with centralized corruption, with administrative order rather than administrative, administrative chaos. Uh, such regions get much higher uh, scores in government rankings. Uh, the reasons for that need to be Explain now, we can only guess, but this is a fact of life. Okay, another five minutes and uh, I'm done. And thanks for being patient and sorry for taking more time. Uh, regional institutional trends. Uh, that's the last issue that we wanted to explore. And I started from saying that international rankings register a decline of institutional performance in Russia by and large across the board. That's been recognized. There is a lot of criticism of these rankings as being biased and uh, subjective and, you know, politically incorrect, so on and so forth. But I should mention you that uh, during the last presidential elections, I think one of the pledges was to improve Russia's standing in terms of doing business by so many points. So this is something that the government of Russia quite obviously seriously takes into account. Now, an institutional decline, but what is happening uh, with the regional institutions along this trend? Uh, the first question is how regional institutions fare against this decline, how stable or unstable leadership positions are. Last but not least, do we see convergence or divergence? And we, we, we will simply show you some data uh, that uh, attempt to answer this question. The first, this table uh, shows you pairwise Spearman correlations, rank correlations between expert rankings. We cannot use simple conventional correlation because these are rankings, but we can use Spearman correlations. And if these Spearman correlations are close to unity, to one, it means that these rankings are consistent across time. If they are uh, decline over years, then it means that uh, uh, these rankings change considerably, and we see a significant decline to as low as 0 0.6, sometimes even less so. So uh, correlations between uh, expert rankings for different years are not particularly high, not exorbitantly high, and in a, in a matter of several years they can go down from 1 to 0 0.6. And that means that there is a whole lot of fluidity in relative positions of Russian regions in terms of the investment attractiveness. Uh, we did the same exercise for the share of informal employment, and this time it's conventional correlations, uh, uh, because uh, these are real numbers. And we see the same, uh, although not as dramatically, but we see that correlations of the shares in the informal economy, uh, several years apart from each other, could be uh, much less than one, could be as low as 0 0.6, 0 0.7, so on and so forth. Uh, in this table, you see, uh, you see regions with the highest, highest, right, Mikhail? Uh, highest level of, uh, of, violent, of violent pressure in business. And you see which regions are leaders uh, along uh, several lines, such as fraud cases, radar attacks against firms, attacks against business people, and you see significant change, significant rotation. Regions that were the worst, they're going, uh, they're improving. The regions that were okay, now they're getting worse, so on and so forth. So again, a whole lot of fluidity. We conclude, indeed, that regional institutions are fluid. Uh, they are not set in stone. And this is good news and this is bad news. This is good news because it means that if a region wants to improve its situation, improve, it can be done even against the backdrop of bad institutions nationwide. But it also means that if today Region X is attractive, solid, uh, uh, good for business, you cannot be sure that that position will be preserved several years down the road. And this is certainly something that is an obstacle to, uh, 
to, uh, uh, to, investment, to investors. D the next question, next to the last for that matter, that we want to ask is, do regional institutions follow national trends? Uh, on that chart, you see national trends for radar attacks and for some regions. I don't have much time, so let me, let's have a look at this chart. Uh, and this is about the size of the informal economy. Uh, this line uh, is Russia proper. It's the share of the employment in the informal economy. And you see that in the course of 10 years, the share has increased. Uh, the share has increased. From, can you repeat that, please, loudly? Yes, from 16% to 22%, so a significant increase nationwide. But, and, and, and indeed, uh, most of the regions, 60 plus regions, uh, uh, for 60 plus regions, we also observed an increase in the share of the informal economy. But in some regions, 17 regions, there was a decrease, a decline. So again, some disagreement. And certainly, uh, regional trends by and large agree with the national ones simply because the national trends aggregate regional trends. But still there are some discrepancies, some deviations, so you're not doomed to have bad institutions even if national institutions are bad. And very finally, and this is very important and I would like to, this is probably also something that we will try to explore and pursue a little bit deeper, is about convergence or divergence. Uh, when your averages decline, uh, do regional institutions get closer? to each other or do they get further apart from each other? Which forces prevail, centripetal or centrifugal? And it appears that they diverge. And we uh, make this uh, conclusion based on a number of analyses. That's the only one that I want to show here. Uh, we measure institutional quality in terms of the informal employment share. And as you see from the year 2001, up until 2013, it has risen from 16.4% to almost 23%. But we also compare these averages to the variances of the shares of the informal employment in regions. And variances also grow. Uh, in 2001, the uh, variance was uh, a little bit less than 5. Uh, in 2013, it's over 7. So it's more than 50% increase in the variance. And therefore, we have a clear, clearly established fact which tells us that when institutional quality declines, uh, institutions in the regions uh, run away from each other. Uh, why? Uh, that's, a, that's a question that deserves uh, probably initial discussion. Let me give you just one explanation, a possible one that comes to my mind, and I will stop at that point. I mentioned earlier in this presentation about this idea of market-preserving federalism. If you have a strong unified market, if you have uh, enabling national legislation, if you have good conditions for uh, movement of, uh, for businesses, for investments, so on and so forth, then indeed uh, regions are forced to improve their institutions to compete for uh, mobile resources. And in that case, uh, you would probably see some convergence of the institutional quality despite of the initial diversity. But if national institutions are weak, that precisely means that the conditions of market-preserving federalism are not met. In fact, the situation with these conditions of market-preserving federalism, such as unified market, strong central government that is uh, able to, uh, to enact uh, pro-business policies, uh, these conditions are less and less there. And as a result, the divergence of Russian regional institutions that our data point out to is a natural outcome. It's a reflection of regional institutions to the deterioration of institutions nationwide. I cannot say this is the case. This is a plausible explanation as far as I'm concerned. And hopefully down the road we'll be, we'll be trying to, to, uh, to prove that this is indeed an explanation or to come up with another one. And sorry it takes so much time. I guess I'm done. And again, if you divide this time by five, the number of co-authors, or by 80 plus, by the number of regions, I think we're doing, we're doing okay, thanks. Thank you very much, so now we have the time for the questions. Please. In the course of your work, you find out the bottom of the bed is 
just come back to this uh, relational table? Because I noticed that it doesn't correlate with anything else. This one? Yeah. Okay. Rule of law. Oh yes, rule of law is irrelevant. In other words, uh, that means that the court system has no significant tangible impact on, 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 on running business and, and this is also kind of a fact of life. Courts are insignificant, non-essential. What is essential is the type of corruption. What is significant is the type of administrative control. Uh, and there could be a case of silny хозяйственник who is in church uh, and who collects his due and otherwise let you go and protects you and gives you access to all the factors that you need to the extent possible. And there is a situation when there is a lack of such silly хозяйственник, in which case multiple bureaucrats are at large. And this is something which is uh, probably bad for business. It adversely affects the institutional quality. That's basically what we have. Those first five types, uh, they, they exist together. It could be could exist uh, in one regional together, or one will prevail, and others. We have several indices. One index is the index of institutional type one. Another one is the index of institutional type two. And by the way, they're correlated to each other, so they're not completely disjoint. Please have a look right over there. There is a significant correlation. They're not orthogonal. And this is because they are not derived from a factor analysis that was performed on the whole set of institutional measures. We started with groups of institutions and we tried to combine them. So this is something that deserves some further analysis. This is not the final say and there are some questions that I cannot answer. This positive correlation is one such thing. But I think we were still able to discern some plausible patterns and they make sense when you think about that. And this is why we decided to show them here. And the rule of law is not one of those. That's very sad. You could, you, you could have hoped that if there are regions with stronger rule of law, then in these uh, regions there will be a high level of security, better access to fight. No, not whatsoever. Completely orthogonal. Completely superficial. Superfluous, I should say, not superficial. Redundant. Well, that's the word. Факультет ненужных вещей, I should say. Well, uh, that's a great idea. Thanks. Uh, it's an excellent suggestion and indeed Many of the banks uh, that lost their license were regional banks, as you know, so we can probably... All the Pakistani banks have lost their licenses. Okay, well, that uh, doesn't really surprise us very much because uh, North Caucasus stand out uh, as institutions of, <coughs> excuse me, of some peculiar type. And these were the regions that exhibited the highest growth, for example, of informal employment. Uh, I, 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 I'm really not prepared. Maybe um, some of my colleagues, maybe Mikhail, can, can talk about this, about bank, uh, lost banking, withdrawn banking licenses, or... Well, it's like an indicator of risk, I would say, in the region. Uh, no, the question is, uh, you measure business environment. Right. You uh, talk about factors, uh, such as, you know, we're saying uh, government interference. Sure, right. Uh, radar attacks on companies. You know, if you talk to the people who are involved in all this kind of merchant banking business in Pakistan, they will mm -hmm. tell you that there's an increase of government interference. My question is, do you interpret those data correct? I mean, maybe that's a good thing that is happening. No, well, conceivably, I, I, again, I, I'm, not, I, I, I'm not an expert in this area, and uh, I can only speculate. I think that there is a genuine effort to cleanse uh, the Russian banking system of uh, uh, outrageously money laundering banks, and this is something that Nabiulina has been doing for quite some time, and this is a very commendable effort. But uh, I want to take your question as an indication that the incidences of such cleansing in different regions could be an uh, indicator as well of the institutional quality in these regions. And I think it might be a very good idea to try to incorporate. Uh, so not every government intervention is, is a bad thing. And besides, please be aware that we're talking about subnational governments, about regional governments. Uh, 
it's not about the interference of central governments. When I talk about government control, I, and again, thanks for giving me a chance to make it explicit, we're talking about the control of regional administrations, not national ones. Mm -hmm. So, but we, we, we'll take due note of what you suggest. That sounds like a promising idea. Mm 